So given this background, um, as I've mentioned earlier, we'll be talking about the transport emission evaluation model for projects, how these are being used, um, and uh, why we actually developed it, who were involved in the development of the team process, what are the team models, and uh, yeah, generally how it was developed. And tomorrow, I'll give you some insights on what we have learned so far in the application of the team tools. No? So um, just to give you also an additional note, um, we developed all these tools uh, to be able to minimize a lot of the, uh, the, the, the data gaps, uh, or i say the data collection gaps that we were noticing. A lot of the, uh, the efforts that would have gone to you know, calculating GHGs, uh, calculating GHG reductions, were not uh, put into fruition because um, you know a lot of issues with regards to data, with regards to the methodology. So we wanted to address some of those. And uh, things like these, like uh, BRD, uh, this is just a sample article that was uh, published in India last year. So it's just saying that you know BRD is injurious to our health. Um, in one way, uh, calculating for CO2 emissions can actually be a way for you to calculate some of the other benefits from the transportation project. So you, it's um, so for some of the models in, inside the, uh, the team uh, set, um, we have included the uh, calculations for criteria air pollutants such as particulate matter, NOx, and uh, some um, other um, benefits such as road safety benefits and uh, some economic indicators. So these are the things that uh, you want to facilitate to be able to contest. So, um, and another one, like for example, this one refers to the environmental benefits of uh, flyover construction over signalized junctions. Um, um, a lot of, uh, you know, sometimes it becomes a default solution to uh, transport problems, especially in developing cities. You know, it's it's about addition of ad, uh, putting up additional infrastructure for private um, road transport, and uh, we wanted to people to take a look at the other alternatives and uh, what are the interventions that can be used to be able to reach or or meet the demand for transportation, but do it in a more environmentally friendly manner. And also an issue about the, uh, the the methodologies that are currently out there, as mentioned by Toto and uh, Eric earlier, uh, the CDM has become a very rigid um, framework for calculating um, CO2 emissions reduction. And it, um, the methodologies currently um, require a lot of data that uh, can only be collected using um, costly uh, meth methods. So uh, out of the 7,398 registered projects, only 27 are transport related. And this is a pity because um, around one fourth of the total um, CO2 emissions from energy is actually from transportation. And it's, it's a big sector in terms of um, not only CO2, but also the other pollutants as well. So we wanted to create something that would help uh, people out in terms of calculating reductions for CO2. Um, yeah, this is just a snapshot. I think uh, Toto gave you a good uh, intro to this earlier. The main point here is that the, the rigidness and the demand for the data uh, that is defined in some of the methodologies in CDM are actually stumbling blocks for a lot of project developers, a lot of um, project participants actually implement CDM projects because of the uh, the costs and the rigidity in terms of the methodology. And uh, this one is actually taken from uh, the Accessing Asia uh, work that we did, but this one is for Asian cities. So aside from the 13 countries, we've surveyed and uh, worked with local uh, experts in, in um, probably around 20 cities around Asia to look at the, the data that's available um, and accessible 
in terms of calculating the CO2 emissions from the transportation sector. Uh, it's a bit small, but the first one is actually activity, the second one is structure, uh, third is intensity, and emission factor. So um, the ones that are available most of the time are the green ones, the blue ones are mostly available but uh, you know uh, depends on the the year depends on um, yeah the year and the mode actually and the yellow ones are mostly limited and uh, the brown ones are not available so the main data that's available and readily accessible for most of these cities are actually the uh, the registration data for the vehicles. Aside from that, things like you know average fuel efficiencies, um, <laughs> mode shares of trips, and uh, um, other emission factors are not normally available in 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 this city. So you, there's a lot of digging that has to come in, and there's a lot of issues in terms of um, the transfer of data, particularly when there are a lot of you know different transportation projects that are being done in cities um, some of the data uh, are not being passed to the uh, either the national or the local governments it stays with the consultants and it's just lost so there are a lot of efficiencies in terms of the data collection and data transfer um, particularly for transportation in the cities so yeah so this one um, again Going back to the objective, I wanted to post these um, quotes um, related to the all you know the issue and the uh, the prospect for 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 developing uh, models for calculating emission reductions for projects. Uh, we have to take into consideration um, some of the some of the insights um, uh, from these quotes. Like the first one, you know, a far better approximate answer to the right question. Uh, than an exact answer to the wrong question. So it's, it's a matter of are we asking the right questions when it comes to dealing with the CO2 emissions reductions from transportation projects. Second one, all model, models are wrong, but some are useful. So I leave it up to you how to interpret that. And the, first, uh, the, the last one is very uh, interesting as well. If two competing theories lead to the same predictions, the simpler one is better. Uh, tomorrow, I will give you a slide that compared um, the TIMP BRT results with another methodology that was developed by uh, our colleagues from the ITDP, the Institute for Transport Development Policy, uh, which was a detailed methodology for calculating emissions reductions from BRT. But uh, it costs a lot of time, and I think it actually cost them a lot of money as well. And um, the the results were uh, yeah they were, the results were compatible. Well, what we're saying here is that uh, particularly if you're in the process of developing a project concept, if you want to apply for you know uh, a market mechanism or um, funding out of um, CO two financing, um, a lot of the work can be done using these steam models initially. We're not saying this is the end tool that you would want to employ particularly you know if you're implementing the project monitoring the project you can come up with more robust and holistic calculations but the start of the process that's most important um, so we um, we don't lose much time in calculating the emissions reductions just to get the sense whether we are doing it right is enough and uh, the team tools can actually help you do that and uh, yeah the the CO2 equation as mentioned by Eric and uh, Toto earlier, um, it's really about these things: uh, the amount of fuel used, the source of the fuel consumed. You know, if it's sometimes it's you know if it's important, like what are the modes being used to to burn the modes and the uh, carbon content of the fuel. So it, this is really about activity and emission factor. That's the most basic equation in a lot of the emission inventories. Um, it's really about that. But uh, later we'll uh, go back to the concept of uh, the as if, which was introduced to you earlier by Eric, the activity, structure, intensity, emission factor concept, um, which was popularized by the late Lee Shipper. Um, doing that uh, or going through that framework would actually give us a lot of insights 
also in terms of calculating the other benefits from transport, so not just CO2. So it allows us to dissect it a bit more to be able to calculate some of the, uh, the savings or the impacts in terms of uh, social and economic benefits. So this is ASIF. So the first one is uh, transportation activity. Second one is the structure of the transportation system. Basically, the, it talks about the modes. Uh, the next slide would be um, related to this in uh, you know, simpler terms. The third one is the intensity of the transportation modes, fuel efficiency. So how many kilometers is being run with one liter of gasoline you know, for, a, for a car on average in your city? And the emission factors are uh, related to the fuel themselves. It depends on the types of emissions, actually. Uh, for uh, CO2 emissions, what is important at the end of the day is calculating how much fuel is burned. It all depends on the carbon content of the fuel. But for other pollutants, such as particulate matter, for NOx, uh, SOx even, uh, VOCs, how the fuel is burned is actually important. And uh, what uh, percentage or the, the, the technology split of the vehicles in terms of the emission standards, uh, if it's, you know, how, many, how, how much percentage of pre-Euro, Euro 1, Euro 2, Euro 3 vehicles are composing your cars or composing your trucks, your buses, would be important in calculating uh, most of these um, traditional air pollutants. Okay. So in simpler terms, activity, for example, if you're talking, uh, imagining yourself uh, applying the concept of as if to your own personal life. Um, when you talk about activity, you, you talk about how many trips do you make per day or today? How far is it trip? So you talk about the number of trips being generated, um, the, the travel distance that you have to take to be able to get to your destination. And of course, um, it, it's also a question of why do you travel, do you need to travel, things like these. Structure. It's all about how do you make the trip, actually. So will you be using a car? Will you be using a bus? Or will you walk? Or will you bike to your destination? Or what are the uh, chain of modes, if ever? So you walk uh, one kilometer or you know uh, 100 meters then you take a, a three-wheeler to the bus station and bus station to the uh, your destination intensity how many kilometers can well can my car travel with one liter fuel and also we talk about here um, you know how how much is the the, the occupancy of these modes um, because the more people that are being served by a mode uh, for one trip, it makes a difference in terms of the, you know, the, the reality in terms of the efficiency of the mode. Even if uh, a bus is running at maybe four kilometers per liter of diesel versus say a 10 kilometer per liter of uh, gasoline for a car, if the bus is having say 30 persons inside of it, at the end of the day, if we calculate the per capita, fuel consumption, uh, the bus would actually w win by a very big margin versus the car. And the uh, fuel carbon content or emission factor, um, we talk about the fuel of the vehicle and how much carbon is in the fuel of the vehicle. So standards, you know, something like uh, 2.4 uh, kilogram per liter for gasoline, 2.6 for uh, diesel. So some of these um, um, values are actually included in the team models, uh, some default values that we employ there. And uh, well, calculating CO2 emissions uh, for transportation, um, these are usually the two main ways um, in, in the terms of the emissions inventory lingo, the top-down and the bottom-up. So the top-down is basically you take mostly from the fuel sales um, data which can be, well, the, the advantages would be it's uh, very easy, well, it's relatively easy, easier to obtain uh, these uh, data, be able to calculate the top-down emissions versus the bottom-up, which is more on the activity-based data. So you talk about um, 
that uh, the amount of travel that is being done by persons, how many how many trips per day they make, where do they go, what modes they take. So you kind of um, take the whole ASIF equation in the bottom-up approach versus the top-down, which is fuel sales. Um, the main um, disadvantage of doing the top-down is that this is actually based on what is reported, for example, to the government. In the Philippines, if you look at the official data from the Department of Energy from 2000 to 2010, compare the two, uh, fuel consumption for transportation, it's basically the same. But our cars are increasing by 4% per year. Our motorcycles are increasing around 12% per year. So where would the demand or where, where would the supply to fuel up the demand come from? The main problem, it either can be um, underreporting by the uh, fuel companies, and there's also an issue of uh, fuel smuggling, which doesn't go to the official records. Last year, there was um, a couple of uh, major companies in the Philippines who have um, brought up the, uh, some estimates, like they were saying that it's around a third of what is actually consumed on the road. They were saying that uh, these are not from legal sources. So they're saying basically a lot, uh, a big portion of what is actually consumed on the road is smuggled. So there's a lot of these um, data gaps also in terms of the top down. And uh, an, uh, a limitation also is that you can't do much with fuel sales data. If you know how much you've burnt or how much you consume in terms of the fuel, but you don't know um, what types of interventions actually can be more effective in trying to address or lower down the consumption. At least in the bottom-up approach, you have some idea how, how, um, how, how much travel is being done, how they are being made, and uh, you know the uh, fuel efficiencies of the modes. So you can use the concept of the avoid, shift, improve in um, defining or, or playing around with some of the numbers in the ASIF equation and coming up with uh, more uh, robust analysis in terms of the, the calculations for emissions reductions. And coming up with the ideas on how to lower down the uh, emissions. Um, again, as I was saying earlier, our Totos and uh, Eric also mentioned about um, the co-benefits uh, that we have to take into consideration when we talk about transport and its impacts on uh, um, CO2 and greenhouse gases. So a lot of uh, different uh, co-benefits. No? So we talk about alleviation of traffic congestion, reduction of vehicle operating costs, increased productivity, uh, reduction of pollution, noise levels, improvement in equity, safety, reduction in fuel subsidies. Um, and uh, we can go further and uh, try to look at health costs and um, other environmental impacts for transportation. And um, at the end of the day, when we have all the elements, we can actually do um, life cycle benefits and trade-offs, but we have to start somewhere and we have to build up the capacity, we have to build up the knowledge base for um, doing all these uh, co-benefit analysis for the transportation sector. Um, this one, um, as I was saying earlier, uh, due to the differences in terms of the, um, the, the, the methodologies used and also this more has to do uh, with the, uh, the, the lack of uh, reliable data um, for uh, calculating emissions from transportation leads to a lot of variation. This was a slide that was done by my colleague Sudhir Gota, which who was actually the the the, the, the architect of the the TIMP models before. Um, this is an analysis of some of the studies that were done in India, uh, CO2 transport. Uh, from uh, basically from 1990 onwards, even the projections. Um, even the 2005 estimates, which would have been not projections but historical during the, the time of the analysis, would actually vary from uh, 98 to two, uh, 216 million tons in terms of the, the volume. So um, 
this gives you an idea of the uh, <laughs> the importance of um, the ASIF parameters and uh, um, how they can actually or the lack of the, the quality sources for some of these can lead to a wide variation in terms of the um, emissions projections. So when you're doing, if you're in the future, if you're going to use the TIMP models, again, um, you have to use this with a lot of, um, how do you say this? You have to take it with a grain of salt, and you have to be aware of the assumptions. It's most important assumptions that you put in the in the model. The model would be as good as the inputs. So whatever you put in there as assumptions would uh, really impact the, the results that you would get.